What's up guys, welcome back to another video. Of course, my name is Gareth from Park Cameras, as it always is. And today we're checking out the Canon R5. And I know what you're thinking, that's a little bit last year. You know, that came out last year. Why are we talking about it now? We've actually done a bunch of stuff last year as well with photographer David Newton. Everyone's already talked about this camera. We're moving on. But actually, we never really got a chance to properly check this out, to properly give it a test and a full review. So actually, I thought it'd be interesting to do that now in 2021, where things are a little bit different. The landscape kind of in the photography industry is a little bit different now. When this came out, this was kind of the leader of the pack. Uh, and now some others have kind of caught up a little bit. So it would be interesting to talk about this from the perspective of what it's like to shoot with in 2021, what it's like for stills, for video, and the actual user experience of shooting with it. Because I think that's really important. And I think this is, this is a very nice high-end camera that deserves to be talked about. So let's just get straight into it. We're not gonna go super tech heavy, not super spec heavy. If you wanna check out the specifications in detail, you can check out the link in the description to go and see everything that you might wanna see, including the price, all that kind of stuff. So that's down in the description, but otherwise we're gonna, we're gonna approach this from more of a kind of how's it feel perspective. What is it like to work with the images in post? What is it like to work with the video? What is it like to actually shoot with? So let's dive in first of all with image quality. Now obviously this is a very much a, a hybrid camera for video and stills. But let's talk about the stills first of all and we'll come on to video in a little bit. First things first, they look great. I mean that's, that's probably no surprise, right? This is a, a nice high-end camera. 45 megapixels, so you're getting really good detail in there. There was a time when that would be huge megapixel count, and now obviously it's uh, it's not the biggest out there, but it still gives you an enormous amount of detail. And I've got to say, for the first time really ever, I found myself pinching and zooming on the touchscreen at the back and really examining the pictures as I was taking them because they do just look fantastic. So whether that was landscape or portrait, I was just checking out the detail. They do look really, really good. And of course, it doesn't hurt. You got the Canon colors in there as well, which always look so good. If you're familiar with shooting with Canon, you already know just how nice oh, those Canon colors are. But it's not just all about that, that megapixel count, the level of detail. Obviously, that helps, especially if you want to crop later on. But there's a couple of things which make this very pleasant to actually shoot with. One of them is the autofocus, and the other one is the image stabilization. So let's just touch on that autofocus for a second. Now, obviously, we've had the dual pixel CMOS AF in the past, and that works really, really well. It's a good system. This has got the Mark II of that system, and it's so good. It's really, really good. Now, at this point, across the board with different brands, autofocus is, is really, really nailing it. And you've got things like eye autofocus, obviously, and animal eye autofocus is big now. This has that as well, absolutely. And to be honest, where this autofocus would have blown me away a couple of years ago, at this point, it's just kind of what I expect from a very high-end camera. So it's not that it's completely blowing me away, but what I would say is I never missed a portrait because of autofocus. So while we were doing portraits, and I was very fortunate to have Matilda to be able to do that with, because of obviously lockdown makes it a little bit difficult to shoot pretty much anything at this point. But I was fortunate enough to have Matilda on hand so I could really test that out and do the eye autofocus. And like I said, I never missed a portrait because of autofocus. I never had one that was out of focus or the camera couldn't keep up. Any that I wasn't able to use or that I'm not putting in this video <laughs> was simply because of user error. They were just because I messed up the composition or anything like that. It means that if you're gonna use this for sports, if you're gonna use this for events, if you can use this for portraits, anything like that, you can rely on that autofocus. And it means that you're not worrying about that. You don't really have to put too much thought into that. That also extends over into video as well, which we'll get onto in a little bit because that's its own whole thing. But the autofocus works great there as well. When I was filming myself with the camera, it was picking up, I was actually picking up a plant just there until I sat down and then it's straight onto me. No problem. I didn't have to set a focus point. I didn't have to do anything. It just immediately picked me up and then I was, it was tracking me around the frame. I was the target of the autofocus. But the other thing that made the shooting experience really nice was the image stabilization. It's the best image stabilization I have ever used in any camera, hands down. It gives you up to eight stops. So that's with a lens like this one, the 24 to 70, which has image stabilization in the lens. That's up to eight stops. That's a lot of image stabilization. That means handheld shooting, no worries at all. You're getting about six or seven stops when you're using lenses that don't have stabilization in the lens. That's still really decent as well. But it, you really feel it, and you feel it particularly when you're doing handheld video. Obviously, it's gonna help for low shutter speed stuff, handheld. 
no worries. But handheld video is where, for me, it really shines. I like shooting handheld. I like the kind of run and gun approach to doing that rather than mounting on a gimbal or something like that, which, you know, is just a whole thing. And if you've got to, if speed is key, if time is critical, being able to run and gun a shoot, whether it's for a client, commercial stuff, or even just for yourself, is, is really key. And having good image stabilization, like in this camera, just makes that much, much easier. Now, one thing I do think helps with that image stabilization is actually the weight of the camera. It's not super heavy. I don't wanna give the impression that I think it's it's way too heavy or anything like that, but it is a bit chunky, you know? It's not as light as you might expect for a mirrorless camera, but I think that works for its advantage because if you've ever used a, a heavier system for handheld, especially for video, it, there's, a, there's a certain kind of smoothness to how it moves because of the weight. It kind of eliminates a little bit of the shake because it's kind of weighing itself down and, and kind of stabilizing itself in that way. So add that onto the image stabilization. I really think this works really well for that kind of stuff. So I was doing shots where I was walking, walking forward, walking backwards, which is always a little bit nervy, especially with, you know, a camera that is not, it's not 50 pounds, is it? So I really, really don't want to drop it. And I'm walking backwards with stairs behind me. Oh, not a good time. But the camera itself, the image stabilization, no worries. So obviously I mentioned at the start of this video, this is very much a hybrid camera. And we've touched on video here and there throughout this review. But this is a very big part of this camera. The video capabilities of this are fantastic. And for me, as a hybrid shooter myself, this is what would make this a very kind of pleasing camera to use. You know, you've got the stills capability, which is fantastic. 45 megapixels, great autofocus, image stabilization, those colors, whoo. But with video, you're getting a lot of that as well, same colors, which is fantastic. But there's loads of big spec to talk about. Now, obviously you've probably heard about loads of it. 8K video in RAW, up to 30 frames a second. 4K, 120. There's a 4K HQ mode as well, which gives you downsampled 8K, but down to 4K, so the file size is a bit more manageable. Let's talk about it. 8K RAW, first of all. Now, realistically, it would be rare that I would use that in my workflow. It's just very, I mean, it's amazing. The detail is amazing. And obviously in RAW, you've got so much room to do whatever you want in post but I just probably wouldn't use it that often because it's gonna use up a huge amount of card space. That for me is actually a bigger deal than the overheating issue, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but the card space, I was testing this out yesterday. I actually filmed myself for about eight minutes. It's about 45 gigabytes, the file. So that's already, you know, really eating into the card space here. It's gonna eat into the hard drive. And then also, when you come to edit that, it's just gonna be difficult. Editing 8K video, again, I tested this out yesterday. Editing 8K video is not impossible at all, but it's way more demanding on your computer. It just is, there's nothing you can really do about that. So you need to have a, a kind of beefier computer to deal with that, which then adds on to the whole thing. So for me, realistically, 8K video would be pretty rare to actually use it. Now, obviously there's overheating issues. I'm gonna actually film myself in 8K with the camera I've already done this a couple of times to kind of try and test it out, but I would do it again because I filmed myself for about 18 minutes. I didn't have any issues with overheating, but we're gonna talk about that in 8K. Let's do it now. So I'm filming myself now in 8K. I've done for a really wide shot, so you can probably see all kinds of things like my light, my mic. I'll do a slow zoom so you get an idea of the resolution. The biggest thing for me with 8K video is the ability to crop. So if you need heavy cropping in your work, if you need to crop a lot, or if you wanna do kind of crops back and forth to hide jump cuts or to hide kind of the, or to give the impression you've got multiple cameras, that's a really useful thing to have. That would realistically be when and why I would use 8K video over things like the 4K HQ mode. Now, obviously we need to talk about the overheating because that was a big thing last year, probably not ideal for Canon. I imagine that wasn't the plan, but we do need to talk about it because it is, it is a very real thing that needs to be discussed. Now, obviously last year, this was a big deal. You know, everything was kind of blown up and, and everyone was talking about how this is unusable. The overheating is, is crazy. That's not, that's not strictly true. Even at that time, it, you know, it was probably being a little bit over the top because realistically, something that I've realized using the camera is I would probably run into card space issues or hard drive space issues before I ran into overheating issues. It's a huge amount of card space that the 8K RAW video in particular uses up. But 
Canon have come out and done various things to kind of try and address some of these overheating issues. So for example, now you can turn off the overheating control in the camera, which, you know, while maybe not completely ideal if you don't want to damage the camera, does allow you to actually at least continue using things if you if you just need to get a little bit extra. You know, there's new firmware which has helped with the overheating, especially in room temperature environments like this. So it's definitely not as bad as it was, and we've all kind of moved on a little bit. I think there's there's certainly ways you can manage it which work better. Is that ideal? No, I'm not gonna pretend that that's the ideal scenario that you have to manage the situation. But, you know, we've had overheating in other cameras before and part of it is that you just have to think about exactly what you want to get out of it, what you, what you plan to get out of it and then move forward with that. There's modes that aren't gonna give you any overheating issues. For example, there's a 4K mode that's not gonna give you overheating issues. I don't like it nearly as much. I think the noise is worse. I think it looks objectively worse. You know, and once you've used things like 4K HQ, and of course 8K, it's difficult to go to something like that and say, well, great, at least I'm not gonna overheat, but it just doesn't look as good. So I think it's just about managing how you're gonna use it and all that kind of stuff. And like I say, 2021, a little bit removed from the original kind of blowing up disaster of that there's already improvements firmware all that kind of stuff and it just doesn't feel as bad you know i've shot probably in total about 40 to 50 minutes of 8k i've ended up you know binning a lot of it because i wanted to get this one kind of sequence in 8k one take just so we could see exactly how that worked but i, I never had it come up and say it was overheating so that never actually happened for me and that was, you know, over about, over a day, I did about 50 minutes of 8K in total. So not too bad. And, and I would never shoot more than that realistically in a day, you know, throughout the day in my workflow. So for me, it probably isn't too much of a big deal. I did loads of 4K 120, or oh, actually it was 100 frames a second because I'm shooting in PAL. But even so, using that never came up as overheating, never came up with a problem in that sense. So am I saying that it's not worth thinking about? No, not at all. I think this is something that is going to affect different people in different ways because we all have different workflows. So it depends on how your workflow works. It depends on whether you think you're gonna be using these modes extensively or not. But what I would say is that there's other things to think about. I'm not saying the card space is a massive problem. You know, what can you do? It's 8K video, especially in RAW. It's gonna take, it's gonna take up a lot of space. But I think that's worth considering as well. There's other things to think about outside of this, but it's worth being aware of, is I guess what I'm saying. It's not, it's not gone. You're not gonna be able to film two hours of 8K with no issues. That's just not gonna happen. But I think it's just not perhaps as bad now as it seemed last year. Now, outside of the 8K, which I think is probably one of the headline, maybe it's like marketing kind of headlines, we've also got 4K 120. Now that, Oh, that is definitely something that would go into my workflow big time. I shoot a lot in 100 frames a second for PAL or 120 frames a second for NTSC. And it really, really is something that I, I enjoy shooting that. It's a very creative kind of frame rate because you can get the slow motion, you can do speed ramps, you can do all kinds of stuff. But having that in 4K oh, gives you a huge amount of versatility for things like cropping, adding a bit of a zoom, all kinds of stuff. It just ups the creativity. And obviously, if you even if you don't want to do any of that, you've still got very high quality detailed footage, which is fantastic. That is one that I think will fit seamlessly into a lot of creators' kind of workflow. I think it works really well for client videos, uh, commercial videos, all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of versatility there. There's also the 4K HQ mode, which, like I mentioned before, gives you a downsampled 8K video down to 4K to get a nice, oh, good detail video but without the insane file sizes of shooting in 8K. And realistically, this is probably the mode I would use the most for things like this, filming myself, all that kind of stuff, just purely because I don't need it in 8K, no one's gonna watch it in 8K, so I may as well have the good high quality 4K footage, less of a demand on the, on the computer, you know, less of a ridiculous amount of card space or hard drive space. So that's the one that I really, really like. Now, obviously you've got things like C-Log and all that kind of stuff if you want to do nice color grading as well. If you don't want to use 8K RAW, I think C-Log is really good actually. I think, it, I think it works really well for the end result, the end result that you want. But let's talk about the actual camera. What is this like to actually use? Now I mentioned before, it's it's a little bit weighty, it's a little bit chunky. I personally like that. I really like that. It's not, it's not ridiculously heavy at all. It's just for a mirrorless camera, it's probably a little bit more heavy than you would 
uh, perhaps expect, but I think that's quite nice. It feels like kind of a pro camera and I think it kind of works well with the kind of stuff that you might want to do with it. I think it actually, in some situations, works to its advantage. The actual feel of the camera is lovely. The grip is super comfortable. It's really nice grip. And it's just sort of big and chunky. I've got big hands and it. It just, it just feels really good. The buttons, the dials, they're all very, very well kind of placed and they have a good tactile feel to them. You know, they feel like they're not flimsy. Let's put it that way. They're very much not flimsy at all. You've got the LCD screen on the top as well, which I really appreciate. It just helps you kind of see things at a glance, settings, you know, what mode you're in, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got the screen and the viewfinder. And the screen, let's start with that. I really like it. It's a flip out screen, which I love. I always think that's fantastic. And sometimes you don't get them on like a pro camera. And I just think it's a shame because I think, they, I think they're really, really helpful. You know, if you want to shoot portraits, it's just, it's just easy, you know, it's just easy. And you can flip around to see yourself if you're going to film yourself, for example. Now that's a touch screen. I was using the menus in basically with touch for a lot of while I was shooting and it works really well. It works fantastically, you know, changing ISO, all that kind of stuff on the screen. Very, very handy to be able to do. The screen's a 2.1 million dot LCD which looks good. It was nice and bright as well. I was shooting out in the sun. Admittedly, it's the winter sun. So, you know, it's not as bright as that crazy summer sun. But I didn't have any issues at all being able to see the screen. And then you've got the viewfinder, 5.6 million dots. It can run at 120 frames a second if you want extra kind of smooth motion or 60 frames a second if you don't need that. It looks really good. 5.6 million dots looks really, really good. It's a nice system overall to use, whether you're doing stills, whether you're doing video, it just feels right. You know, the menus are easy to use. It's comfortable. You've got things like the joystick or the touch screen or multiple ways of kind of controlling things. And it's also got very good weather sealing, which, you know, is, is important because if you want to use this anywhere but in a studio, that's important. You don't know what kind of conditions you're going to have. And it's going to help people who want to do wildlife or anything where you might face adverse weather conditions. You know, I had this out in the snow, I actually put this down in the snow without worrying about it at all. You know, it's, it's just a nice thing to be able to, to be able to know that the camera's gonna be able to take a little bit of punishment in that regard. So where does this stand in 2021? Because obviously when this came out, this was pretty much the, the first one leading the charge with that kind of next generation of cameras. It was a big leap instead of the kind of incremental upgrades. And I think it still absolutely stands, you know, out there. Some others have joined it as well, but this has a huge amount to offer as a camera. Whether you're a photographer, a videographer, or a hybrid shooter, this has a huge amount to offer for anyone really at all. And it comes in at a price point, which I think is pretty decent actually for what you're getting here. So yes, others have kind of caught up and there's different things available now and in some ways being pushed forward as well. But this really holds up as a very nice high-end hybrid camera for 2021. This has certainly not been left behind in 2020. And I think that you could do a huge amount worse than this camera. I think this is gonna be great for all kinds of people doing all kinds of different photography genres and video as well. You could buy this just as a videographer and it'd be fantastic, or just as a photographer and it'd be fantastic. But it's those hybrid shooters that are really gonna make the most of this camera. Now, if you have any questions, pop them down in the comments. I'd also love to hear your thoughts. So any thoughts on the R5, let me know down in the comments because I'd love to hear that, absolutely. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's links down in the description so you can go and check out the camera for yourself, all the spec, all the pricing, all that kind of stuff. Check that out down in the description. If you like the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and of course, subscribe because there's loads of videos all the time. We know we've got reviews like this, we've got tutorials, we've got loads of stuff. I will see you in the next video and as always, Thanks for watching.